Now our text this evening is 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter and the 5th verse. What's the first word? Examine. Examine. Students look forward to examinations, not always with uh, joy, but uh, nevertheless they do look forward to them, don't they? Now this is an interesting examination that's spoken of here. Who is to do the examination? Each one of us. And who is to be examined? The examiner and the examined are the same. Is that right? Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Another word for prove there is test. So examine or test or prove your own selves to see whether you're in the faith. Now, in the providence of God, a few days ago, I was led to a passage that helped me understand this better than I've ever understood it. In fact, it cleared up some questions in my mind. And I'm just as sure as I stand here that there's at least a few people and maybe many in this audience tonight that are going to get a view of this, that you'll thank God as you go out these doors tonight that God led you to this chapel tonight. This comment on this text is found in an article by the Prophet to the Remnant in the Review and Herald of February 28, 1907. February 28, 1907. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Some conscientious souls. What kind of people? Conscientious souls. Are there any here tonight? Well, I hope everybody is. But not everybody that's conscientious does what this is, says here that I'm going to read. It says some conscientious souls. If you're conscientious, you might be one of these. And there's nothing wicked about what I'm going to read. It's just factual. Some conscientious souls on reading this. Reading what? Our text. Let's read it again together. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Some conscientious souls, on reading this, immediately begin. Now, what does immediately mean? Right now. They immediately begin to do something. Won't that be interesting now to find out what it is? that some conscientious souls immediately begin to do as soon as they read this text. Let's see, let's read it once again. All together. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. That's enough. Some conscientious souls, on reading this, immediately begin to cr criticize their every feeling and emotion. Now you notice what they don't do. It doesn't say they begin to criticize other people. We know that isn't a good thing. They criticize themselves. Well, isn't that what the text says? No. No, it doesn't say that. Some conscientious souls on reading this immediately begin to criticize their every feeling and emotion. But this is not correct self-examination. Well, how many of you ever took an examination? May I see your hand? Yeah. All right. There's a set of questions. And it wouldn't do to get a set of questions for a geometry examination mixed up with one in geography, would it? or one in history mixed up with one on agriculture or gardening. So in examining ourselves, we want to be sure that we have the right set of questions. That's the only way we can get the right answers. Some conscientious souls 
immediately begin to criticize their every feeling and emotion. But this is not correct self-examination. It is not the petty feelings and emotions that are to be examined. What does petty mean? It means little, doesn't it? Yes. Small. Do we all have feelings? Oh, yes. Some of us are more conscious than others, but all of us have feelings. But this is not what we're to do what with? Examine them. It is not the petty feelings and emotions that are to be examined. The life, the character, is to be measured by the only standard of character, God's holy law. What is it that's to be examined? The life, the character, our works, not our feelings, bear witness of us. Now let's see. What is it that's to measure character? God's holy law. Now do the Ten Commandments deal with how we feel, whether we feel happy or not so happy? whether we feel full of faith and courage or whether we feel a bit depressed. Is that what the Ten Commandments deal with? No. The Ten Commandments deal with what? Our acts and the motives that prompt them. Our worship to God and our conduct toward our fellow men. And this is the what? The standard. This is the measure. This is the yardstick. These are the scales. These are the balances of the sanctuary in which our lives are weighed by God. Wouldn't it be a good plan, dear friends, in our self-examination to use the same set of questions that God uses in his examination of us? What do you say? Why, sure. And so James 2.10 says, Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For that law which said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Now together on the twelfth verse. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. What's another word for judged in our text tonight? examined, or tested, or proved, or measured, or weighed. All these have to do with examination to see whether we measure up or not. And what is it that's not to be examined? Our petty feelings and emotions. Instead, we're to be measuring our what? Our lives, our characters. You know, I thank God for this, dear friends. And I know it's going to help us help hundreds of dear people who go along groaning and worried because they don't feel a certain way. And so, as this says, when they read, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith, they look inside to see how they feel, to see whether they're in the faith or not. But that isn't the self-examination this is talking about. Now notice the next sentence. The feelings, whether encouraging or discouraging, should not be made the test of the spiritual condition. If I'm breaking God's law, the fact that I feel like singing doesn't mean I'm a Christian. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Where is that found? 1 John 2.4. 1 John 2.4. 2, Say it with me, will you? He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, you and I wouldn't want to call anybody a liar, but it's, it's proper for God to call people a liar if they're telling lies, isn't it? Yes. And he says, people that claim to know God and yet deliberately, rebelliously, willfully break his law are what? They're liars. I don't want to be a liar, do you? And so I'm to examine my life. 
to see if I am deliberately choosing to break one of God's commandments, as written on the stone, as magnified in his word. If I am, no matter how happy I feel, I don't pass the examination. I don't pass it in heaven, and I shouldn't pass my own self-examination. But on the other hand, oh, dear friend, if I give my heart to Jesus and confess my sins to him and make a full surrender, then I'm accepted in the beloved, and whether I feel lighthearted and joyous or whether I feel weak and needy and down under, I'm still what? I'm still God's child. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, First John 3, 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 5, 1. No, that's Romans 8, 1, isn't it? Romans 5, 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If we confess our sins, then what? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Where's that one? First John 1, 9. You know, you know them well. That's good. Ah, friends, thank God. These are the things that we're to measure by, what God has said, not how we feel. That has nothing in the world to do with it. The feelings, whether encouraging or discouraging, should not be made the test of the spiritual condition. By God's word, we are to determine our true, understand, our true standing before him. Many are bewildered on this point. What does that mean, bewildered? They're confused, perplexed, uncertain. Many Christians bewildered on this point. How do you stand with God? Now, I want to tell you something, friends. You want me to be frank and plain and true and factual, don't you? The devil knows that a lot of Christians are uncertain and dissatisfied, and so he brings in an easy-going, cheap grace program that's supposed to make them feel confident, to fix them up in five minutes so they know they're saved. We have nothing to worry about after that. Dear friends, I want the reality. Paul said, I die daily, 1 Corinthians 15, 31. Every day he had to face this matter of finding his feelings, his desires, going one way and the call of God going in another direction. And instead of doing the way his feelings or his desires would suggest, he did God's will. He was victorious. Every day you and I must come anew to God's law and measure our lives. We must come anew to the cross and confess our weakness and the sinfulness of our nature and receive anew that precious offering of the blood of Christ to cover our past failures and to Keep changing our minds so that we love what God loves and hate what God hates. But many are bewildered on this point. When they are happy and joyous, they think that they are accepted by God. When a change comes and they feel depressed, they think that God has forsaken them. You know the difference between a compass and a weather vane, don't you? Which way does a compass point? Points north. That's why we use a compass, isn't it? Sure. Does it point north on cloudy days? On rainy days? Does it point north even at night? Does it? Just the same? Sure. And it doesn't quit it on sunny days, does it? Now, which way does a weather vane point? Well, that depends on which way the wind is blowing. In fact, that's why it's used. And it's all right to use a weather vane to find out which way the wind is blowing. But it's not all right to use a weather vane to know which way is north. No, no. What do we want for that? A compass. And thank God his promises are compass. Are a compass. They always point in the same direction. 
Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Thank God. As we look to the cross, we are drawn as the seal to the magnet, and we know which way is home. God does not desire us to go through life filled with a distrust of him. It is as much your duty to believe that God will fulfill his word and forgive you as it is to confess your sins. I thought that was wonderful. Let's look at that a minute. Is it my duty to confess my sins? Sure. Is there any other way to have them forgiven? No, that's something that I'm to do, if we confess our sin. But here's something else that's just as much my duty as confessing my sins. What is it? To believe that God forgives them. The text on that is Mark 11:24. What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. So, watch. As I follow Paul's text tonight and examine myself, I am not to be studying my feelings and emotions to see whether I feel a little happier or a little freer of guilt or a little more courageous or a little more hopeful. No, no. I am to examine my life to see if there's some sin I haven't confessed. And if there is, what am I to do? Confess it. Give it up. When? Right now. But somebody says, but oh, Brother Frisee, that's the trouble. I don't know whether I've confessed all my sins or not. Well, bless your heart, just confess the ones you know about. That's the only ones you can confess. God's not unreasonable. No, no. He's more anxious to cleanse us and accept us than we ever are to get accepted. And so he says, if we confess our sins, Obviously, the ones that we know about, we couldn't confess any others. Then he's faithful and just to do what? Forgive us our sin. Somebody says, but oh, I'm so afraid there's something I forgot. Well, ask God to bring it to your mind. If he doesn't bring it to your mind, you can't confess it, can you? If you do confess it, it proves it, it was brought to your mind. And so when you confess that which you know about, then you are to do what? Believe that he does what? Forgives you and cleanses you and accepts you. This is the way to conduct the examination, dear friend, so that we go away knowing that we've passed through faith in Jesus Christ. We've been accepted. We pass, dear friends, with a hundred percent. You know, I thank God this examination is different from the examinations of this world. Up in my, one of my files at home, I have my eighth grade diploma. I have the marks that I got in the various subjects up there on the back of it. In reading and in penmanship and arithmetic and grammar, Bible, so forth. But you know, whatever that grade was, whether it was 97 or 87 or 75 or 100. There's nothing I can do now that changes that. Is that correct? That stands there. But oh, when we come to this examination in the light of God's law, and we go down through the commandments and we find we failed on this point and found we failed on that point, and we remember reading in James 2.10 that to break one point is to be what? Guilty of all. We come down through and as the result of our self-examination, if we're honest, we give ourselves a grade of what? Zero. But that isn't the end of the examination. Oh no. That's to get us ready for these wonderful promises we've just been looking at. If we confess our sins, he's what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
You remember that beautiful vision in Zechariah, the third chapter? Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, clothed with filthy garments, and Satan standing there, accusing him and resisting him. And the Lord Jesus Christ takes all those filthy garments away and clothes him with change of raiment, even his own precious life, and puts a crown, a holy mitre upon his head. Oh, that's to show what happens when you and I come to Jesus in our weakness, our unworthiness, give ourselves to him and let him take away the filthy garments and give us his righteousness. It all depends on his doing it, and his doing it depends upon our choosing it. We cannot do it of ourselves, but he waits for our consent. Believe that they are pardoned. It is as much your duty to believe that God will fulfill his word and forgive you as it is to confess your sins. Exercise faith in God. Many Oh, I was struck with this. I marked it with a different color than anything else on the page. Listen. Many who long to see others resting in the pardoning love of Christ do not rest in it for themselves. Seeking to encourage others to be restful in God, but they're not restful. Seeking to help others to find the peace of God, but they haven't found it. Oh, is there anybody like that here tonight? Passing out the water of life to others, but thirsty in your own heart. Trying to get others to find the joy of the Lord, but your own heart, worried, uncertain, perplexed, bewildered. Listen. Many who long to see others resting in the pardoning love of Christ do not rest in it for themselves. But how can they possibly lead others to show simple childlike faith in the Heavenly Father when they measure His love by their own feelings? I was struck by that last expression. They measure His love. Whose love? God's love. By what? their own feelings. What a graphic way to put it. Does Jesus love you? Well, I wonder. I wonder. I thought so yesterday. I felt so happy. But today I got a letter that I don't know what to do about. I wonder where God is. I wonder what he thinks of me anyway. Perhaps I'm going through some trial. Did Job wonder where God was as he went through the darkness? Yes. Oh, friends, we're poor, weak human beings. But listen. Let's see what Job finally said. He knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. I will trust him. I believe him. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Praise God for certainty. In the word of God. Let us trust God implicitly, remembering that we are his sons and daughters. Let us train ourselves to believe his word. You know how to you know how anybody trains anybody himself or anybody else in anything? to do the same thing in the same way over and over again. That's what the people that train dogs are told to do. If you want a dog to do something, tell him the same thing in the same way, again and again. That's the way you train a child, isn't it? Yeah. Now, tonight we're learning to train who? Ourselves. To do what? To believe God's word. Friends, that means if I understand what it's talking about, that when I read a promise in the word of God, I'm to say, Lord, I believe it. 
What makes you believe it? Oh, I just feel it in here. No, no, I don't feel it in here necessarily. I read it in here. What's in here in my poor heart may change. But the word of the Lord liveth and abideth forever. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. As I heard a friend of mine put it, think of the time in your past experience when Jesus seemed the closest to you of anything in your whole life. Remember, he's just the same right now as he was then. Look ahead to the future of eternity. Think of all the wonderful experiences you're going to have with Christ in the hereafter. And remember, he's just the same right now as he will be then. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. And I'm to train myself to do what? Believe. Now, there's a negative side to this work of training as well as the positive. Expression deepens impression. And so when I read the promise of God, I am to train myself to say, Lord, I believe it. Negatively, I am to utterly refuse to express a doubt, a disbelief, a question. As the prophet of God puts it in Christ's Object Lessons, never allow yourself to talk in a hopeless, discouraged way. If you do, you will lose much. What was the first word in that sentence? Never. never. How often is that? Never. Is never. You mean I'm never to allow myself to talk in a helpless, discouraged way? Hopeless, discouraged way? That's what it says. I'll tell you one very fine thing about that. A thing that you're never to do, you never have to stop to think, is this the time to do it? <laughs> it's always the time to not do it. Never allow yourself to talk in a helpless, hopeless, discouraged way. You think of Paul and Silas down there in the dungeon at Philippi at midnight with their feet in the stocks and their backs bleeding, and they did what? Sang. Now, if there was ever a time to talk in a hopeless, discouraged way, I think that would be it, wouldn't you? At midnight, in a dark dungeon, with your feet in the stocks and your back bleeding. But never means never. And so they didn't talk in a hopeless, discouraged way. They did what we studied about two weeks ago tonight. They sang. And song is a weapon that we can always use against Discouragement. You remember that from two weeks ago, don't you? All right. Let us train ourselves to believe his word. Do you believe he will do as he has said? Then after you have complied with the conditions, carry no longer the burden of your sins. Let it roll upon the Savior. Yes. You remember in Bunyan's allegory, that man that left the city of destruction and started out for the celestial city? And on his back was a heavy burden that tried every way he couldn't get rid of. And so he toiled along, day after day, carrying that heavy burden, heavy burden. He tried different ways. He listened to different people talk. But nothing worked. He still had the burden. But thank God he still kept going. And there are many Christians that are still going and growing in the Christian way. And still they have this burden of worry and concern over their sins and over their spiritual condition. And so Christian, in Pilgrim's Progress, goes along with that burden. But you remember that one day, in his journey up the path, he came to a place where there was a cross. And he stood and looked. And as he gazed, he felt those strings loosen. And the load fell off his back. And it rolled and rolled down into an empty grave. And Bunyan concludes, and I saw it no more. Thank God, my friend. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. 
It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. He used to sing that. Any, anybody here know that? Well, let's sing it. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Amen and amen. Now if there's somebody who would like to speak tonight to God's glory, do it. Listen. If you spoke last week or week before, suppose you sit back and listen for a while tonight and let the folks that haven't spoken for at least two or three weeks, let them speak. Now, you folks that didn't speak the last two weeks, you press your way right up here. Now, some of you I know didn't speak because you're visitors here tonight. You haven't been here for a while. And all the visitors are invited to share your witness with us. We'd love to hear from any of our visitors from far and near, and of course the people on campus or in the community, just provided that you didn't speak last week or week before. All right? The Lord has taught me a valuable lesson this week, and I've grieved him this week, but I just want to thank him for the victory he's given me, and I just... I just praise his name. I just want to, it's just so good to know him, and I just want to thank him for the. Thank yeah. you, brother. I'm glad you said that because it leads me to pick up a thought I'm not sure that I clinched when we went through it. I was speaking about my own examinations back when I was in the eighth grade, and I didn't get a hundred in all of them. And we were we're looking through the law, and we agreed that if we were honest, we'd give ourselves a grade of what? Zero. But the beautiful thing about this examination is when Jesus leads us to his cross and we let go the burden of sin and his righteousness is put to our credit, then we pass not 75% or 85 or 95 or 99, but how much? 100%. Is that really true? That's true. Are you accepted just as if you had not sinned? Mm -hmm. Folks, you can't get any better than that. That's a good passing grade. All right, brother. You know, I have to ask your forgiveness because this week I have been speaking very much in a discouraged way. And I know that it's spread. And I'm sorry, and I want each one of you to forgive me. It's so easy to speak of discouragement and so hard to be the other way. But I thank God that he gives us the power to be the other way. And I want to be like Paul and Silas. I haven't experienced any trials, really. Nothing like Paul and Silas. And if we're going to be able to sing during the last, t last days, when we might be tortured or anything else, we have to be able to sing now. And I really want you to forgive me and help me, and I'll try to help you. Let's never speak of discouragement again. God bless you, Don. Let's sing that one again. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. I'm so thankful for God's love. I realized not too long ago that while I thought I was completely surrendered, I really wasn't. I was holding some things back. And I realized then that if it's not all, it's nothing. Well, God is patient, and I'm so thankful that he never gave up on me. I'm so thankful that I, he gave me the grace to kneel down and pray, Lord, help me to give myself wholly to you, to guide my life completely, to use as you would have me be used. 
And I'm so thankful that his presence is near now as much as it was when I felt him that close. And I'll know that he'll be with me when those clouds will come. I'm real thankful, very thankful for his love. He's thankful for your witness. I surely did like this talk tonight, that you don't have to examine your feelings. It simplified that to me. You examine the, you the way that God's going to by the Ten Commandments. That's much easier, much simpler, and I appreciate it, and I'm thankful for it. God I'm bless. thankful for God's great love to me, and if that's uppermost in my mind, then I'm sure that by His grace, I can take this examination by, with him. Amen. I just want to say tonight that God's been awfully good to me, and especially since he brought us all the way here to live by Wildwood. And I'm so thankful for his love and care. God bless you, sister. I have a question. And I'd like to ask the question, and give my understanding of the answer and then I want to get your rewording of it. <laughs> and the reason I'm asking it is because I think this might be the same question some of the rest of us have. You know, I grew up Seventh-day Adventist and as a child I memorized the verse that says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I grew up memorizing John 3, 16, that God loves me. So as I've grown up, the question in my mind has not been, am I forgiven? Or does God love me? That hasn't, been a, that hasn't bothered me. What's bothered me is, have I repented? Have I confessed, really confessed deeply? Have I really um, done my part? to be forgiven. And um, the way it faces me right now is like this. Um, have I spent as much time as I ought to in prayer and Bible study? Or have I been patient? Or have I done this or that that I ought to have done? Have I really done it as well as I ought to? Or have I failed to do my part so that God can forgive me? And um, so this has been my question. Now my answer, that as I'm coming to see it now, is that no matter how well I may have done my part to repent, to confess my sins, or to uh, all my righteousness is as filthy rags. Hmm. And so as I look to see whether I have measured up, you know, how I stack up with that law, my part, no matter how good it might appear, is filthy rags. And you know, that just gives me a great sense of happiness. To know that no matter how good, <laughs> and you know, as I look at my, my life, I don't see anything good in it. But even if it were good, in God's sight, it shouldn't be good in my sight. <laughs> if you know what I mean. And I just cannot trust in my repentance or my confession. I just have to trust in Him. Forgiveness no matter how my life is. And just say, Lord, I thank you for your mercy and have mercy on me. Now, I'd like to hear it from you. I'm sure you can say it much better. <laughs> you know, there, there would be about four billion ways to say this because there are four billion people in the world. And every one of us must know it for himself. But let me make this aspect of it very simple, dear friends. Sin is not so much something we do, it's an attitude. Not so much an act, it's a state of mind. Sin is rebellion against God. Sin is rebellion against God. Sin is spitting in the face of Jesus in the judgment hall. 
Seen as driving the nails in his hands on Calvary. Seen as mocking him in his dying agonies. That's what sin is. Now God can deal with our weakness. And he can deal with our past rebellion if we give it up. God isn't waiting until we... I was going to say brush our teeth after every meal and do all the other health habits and have a card that has the stars, you know, for everything that we've done. No. God can accept me and wants to accept me right now, provided I lay down my arms and make a full surrender. Give up my sword and accept him as my Lord and Savior. Now I'm to do that moment by moment. And I'm not to be looking to my failures or to my attainments. But there is one thing that I must settle one moment by moment. Do I this moment say to Jesus, no more rebellion, I'm yours. No more rebellion, I'm yours. This doesn't merit us anything, but it opens the way for Christ's merits to be applied to our account. Jesus can cover all our failures and he can cover all our past sins but Jesus cannot cover present active deliberate rebellion he can't do that this would be treason to the government of God and Christ is not about to engage in that sort of treason and that's what's involved if we confess our sins it isn't just some legal acknowledgement of them it's a matter of choosing that what we chose yesterday to do, this moment we repudiate. In other words, we wish we hadn't done it. And we choose to give it up. And he said one verse here that has helped me some on this. It's Romans 6, verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Thank you, brother. So glad for this. This helped me. What you said, what you gave me a chance to say. Thank you. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. The great reason why we're to come to the cross day by day isn't so that we can put, on, put in so many minutes and chalk up a, a good mark for ourselves. It's so that beholding our attitude will be deeper and deeper in love toward that man that hangs on the tree and in sorrow for what we've done to hurt him. This is the change that took place in that dying thief on his right. At nine o'clock Friday morning, that thief was in rebellion against God, against society, against righteousness, against everything. But by noon, bless the Lord, beholding that man on the middle cross, under the influence of the Spirit of God, his spirit had become so softened and tendered that he cried out, Lord, remember me. Jesus said, I tell you today, not after you've spent so long doing this and that and the other thing, but right now, you will be with me. I'm telling you now, you have my word for it. You're assured. He died saved. And if any of us are ever saved, we'll be saved the same way the thief was. Beholding Christ and giving ourselves to him. Giving up our rebellion and accepting his blood to cleanse us. It seems like all day today I was making mistakes and I don't think anybody around me knew it but the Lord knew it it was between him and me and every time I'd fall he'd put a song in my heart that we've been singing in our home one verse of it that uh, says my son despise not the chastening of the Lord be not weary of his correction and I learned something about the willingness of God and his character, his love, 
and how he, he wants to make us perfect and he wants us to understand that his chastening is for our good. And as some of the people mentioned up here tonight about Paul and Silas's singing, I was thinking that uh, they must have sung an awful lot before, That's too, right. in order to have sung at that point. We need to sing when we're down. Thank you, sis. Right on target. So glad for the experiences that our Lord gives us to help us to understand these different points. He gives us things in our mind and then he gives us a personal experience to explain it to us. And I'm thinking that in the future we're going to be able to, we're going to have to be able to pass through some trying situations. And you can't develop cheerfulness by not being cheerful today. You're going to be cheerful under discouragement. You have to learn how to be cheerful today under discouragement. And when it gets worse discouraging, then you can be cheerful. And you can't develop faith by not exercising faith in his promises. And I had an experience recently where I had a trial. And you know, I came out of that trial victorious. And it, there's nothing, there's nothing that will encourage faith any more than exercising faith in a trial and believing God's promises and proving him and then having him do something and, and, and help you. And you come out of that with, with vibrant faith, whereas if I had doubted, if I had given way to the discouragement that was constantly pressing in on me, I know I would have come out of that. Even if he would have answered my prayers, I would have come out of that discouraged and said, well, I failed. God may have succeeded, but I failed. But that's not what he wants for us. God will always succeed. But he wants to share his success with us. He doesn't want just him to succeed and us to fail. But he wants to succeed and have us be a co-partner with him and succeed with him. Right. And if we'll stop looking to our feelings and stop listening to our own imaginations and our own doubts and the voice of the enemy and start repeating over and over his promises and rest in the Lord as it says in Psalm 37, 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him and don't worry ourselves over the consequences of what we think may happen. We'll be victorious in him. Thank you. Now when these have spoken, we'll conclude. Well, I was sitting down in my pew and I was thinking, listen all to these glowing testimonies and I wish I could say that I felt really glowing inside, but, and I wasn't going to come up and yet I just felt that I had to say something for the Lord that he's done for me. Um, everybody in their life has trials and tribulations. Ours are all different. God's made us all different and the experiences in our life different. And I've never been under, able to understand it all or why, and I guess that's really merciful, but a text that's meant a great deal to me through this time is found in Psalms 119, verse 75, and it says, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that, that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. And I'd like to thank the Lord tonight for whatever reason he sees fit. He has seen fit that he has afflicted me in the way that he has and that he, his promises are true and that he says that my grace is sufficient for thee and that my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And I'm just so thankful to Jesus tonight that he's given me the strength to see me through the trials I've been going through. And I, I just praise his name that even though sometimes my feelings aren't the way they ought to be, that his grace is always there for me and it's enough for me. God bless you. This week I was um, reading a book and it led me to the scripture um, that David just read, Romans 6, 11. And I looked at that and the Lord really showed it to me. And he also showed me that I've spent the most of my life not really believing him and his word. It says, consider yourself dead to sin, not um, think about dying to sin, you know, Paul does say we, we die daily, but it's the act of we're dead. Just believe it because Christ has died for me and his death is mine. And somehow at that moment I believed it and I can't explain the joy and peace. Amen. And I pray that each one of us, each one will um, come to know this. Amen. I'm so thankful that 
God's love for us is much, much higher than our highest conception of it can be. And in Luke 15:20, it says, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I'm just really thankful that Jesus loves us like that. Amen. I really appreciated the message so much tonight. You know, most of us this week had an outing, and all of us had a very good time. On our outing, we had a chance to see some wild animals. And one of the things we saw was some lions. We went to lion country down below Atlanta. I'd never seen lions before uh, real close. And I got an idea what Daniel must have felt like when he was in the lion's den. You know, um, when our brother mentioned that Paul and Silas sang in the prison, I thought of Daniel, and I thought what he must have felt like in the lion's den. You know, Paul and Silas had this experience of resting in the forgiveness of Jesus. And according to Daniel here, he had this experience too, because he says when the king asked him if he was okay, he said he was all right because before God he was innocent. You'll find that in the 22nd verse of Daniel 6. And I'm sure that Paul and Silas had this assurance in their heart that they were innocent. Their sins were forgiven and they were resting in the love of Jesus and they could sing. Well, I want my experience to be, no matter if it's lions I'm facing or a prison or dungeon or just everyday duties that come, I want the experience of being able to rest in the forgiveness and in the help of Jesus. Good. I'm a student from Oakwood College. My name is Juan Leon. And we came up here to do some carpooling work. And I saw Elder Frizee walking down the road. And I said, that's Frizee. But I didn't know, it, I've never seen him before in my life. But it just it seems like this would be Elder Frizee. <laughs> and Lloyd, my friend, um, he knows Frizee, Elder Frizee very well. And he didn't even recognize me. But I said, there's Frizzy, you know, pull over, let's say hi. And so we shook his hand and met him. But what Elder Frizzy doesn't realize is that he has spoken to me many of times and talked to me and has led me many a times through his tapes. I've listened to his sermons, I guess, as many as 50 times. I'm a new believer. I've been in the church, I guess, about maybe two years. I'm a local elder from Chicago, but I came to Oakwood to finish my studies. And I had a, an experience today where I was talking to a, a young gentleman. He's of the Baptist faith. And he came to believe the truths according to the Bible. And I just asked that you would pray for this man. I can't remember his name, but he was really zealous in learning more. And I witnessed to him there on the street for about 30 minutes. And he seemed totally convinced someone had been telling him um, false views concerning the Adventist faith. But it seemed like through the grace of God, everything had been cleared up. So he wants to learn more. And I gave him um, a track. And he's going to send off for the Bible study. I'd also like to say to Elder Fazee, I feel that this sermon was especially for me. God. Because I'm very hard on myself. And I just thank the Lord that he isn't as hard and stern with me as I am with myself. <laughs> I've been judging myself as far as feelings and as far as thoughts. And I have to realize that Satan will put thoughts in your mind, but you have to rebuke them. And I just pray, I just petition your prayers that I will go stronger in the Lord and realize that it's not by my merits nor by my works. But I have to constantly look towards the cross. Thank you, my friend. God bless you. Well, we better sing it again, hadn't we? <laughs> at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, 
And the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. Now there's plenty more in the kitchen, folks. And if any of you'd like a second helping, go down page 111 of Messages to Young People. That's easy to remember, in case you didn't bring a pencil. One, one, one. MYP 111. There's a chapter begins there on living faith. One of the most wonderful things ever written. To just thrill your soul. All right. Shall we stand? Anybody here tonight has a special burden you'd like to be remembered in the closing prayer? Just raise your hand. Bless your heart. Friend, God sees you as if you were the only one here. Dear Lord, we know you've heard us tonight as we have looked to the cross. We're leaving our sins and letting the burden roll on Jesus. And we're so glad that we can go out to tell others the good news that as they surrender, thou dost accept them. As they give up their rebellion, thou dost enlist them as soldiers in the loyal army. And we thank thee. In Christ's wonderful name.